Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shutborough, and in particular, welcome to the 2024 edition of Horrific Tales in the Cotswolds. Tonight, we're going to take you on a tour to discover some of the most horrific tales in the Cotswolds. In the dark depths of Oxfordshire, a short distance west of the bustling market town of Whitney, we find a small hamlet called Minster Lovell. It was here in 1708 when workers were making alterations to this ancient home that a centuries-long mystery was finally solved. The puzzle of the disappearance of Lord Francis Lovell. The cat, the rat, and Lovell the dog ruleth all England under a hog. So goes the contemporary ditty by William Collingbourne, who was much condemned for writing those lines, mocking King Richard III. The hog referred to the white boar found on Richard's crest. Sir William Catsby was, of course, the cat, and Sir Richard Ratcliffe the rat. Lovell the dog referred to the wolf which adorned Lord Francis Lovell's crest. These three were the king's closest confidants, a position for which they paid heavily. Ratcliffe was killed fighting alongside his king at the Battle of Bosworth in August 1485, effectively the last proper battle in the Wars of the Roses, in which Henry Tudor defeated Richard III. After the battle, Catsby was handed over to the people of Leicester, who promptly executed him. And Lovell, whilst evidently escaping the field of battle, then disappeared, something at which he seems to have been very talented. Having reappeared to fight at a succession of skirmishes, he finally fought at Stokefield in 1487, and once again was not listed on the casualty toll but disappeared from sight for the last time. For centuries, no explanation for Lovell's disappearance was found. It was over 200 years later, in 1708, when workers were installing a new chimney at Minster Lovell, Lovell's country home, and they broke through what appeared to be a solid wall. Behind it, they found a secret vault, and bringing up lights to investigate, they found something truly remarkable. A book, pen and paper, sat on a table in the center of the chamber. Drawn up to the table, seated in a chair, was the skeleton of a man, with the moldy remains of a cap from two centuries ago, dropped nearby. It seemed to confirm what was always a rumor that Lovell had returned to hide at his ancestral home. Either by accident or betrayal, he had become trapped in the safe haven, which eventually became his tomb. The workers watched, awestruck, as the cold air flooded into the steel room, and the skeleton shivered, crumbling to dust before their eyes. Francis Lovell had vanished for the last time. Moving northwest above Burford, we find the slightly disappointing Witchwood Forest. The time was when this woodland stretched all the way from Charlbury to Burford and beyond. But it's before the deforestation of the First World War, and of course before our even more destructive times, that our story takes place. Early in the 19th century, Witchwood was a great temptation for poor agricultural labourers, with a wide range of game up for grabs, at least for anyone willing to brave Lord Churchill's very efficient gamekeeper, 
James Millin. In 1824, Millin's suspicion fell upon two local laborers, William James of Tainton and Henry Pitterway of Swinbrook. James was born in Burford in 1776 and had become an apprentice to a slater and plasterer. After marrying his cousin Mary, the couple endured their fair share of domestic tragedy. Both the first and last of their six children were born with disabilities, and this, no doubt, had an effect on James's state of mind. He began to neglect his business and took to stealing deer, along with his accomplice, Henry Pitaway, a young man half his age. It wasn't long before Millin had his eye on James and soon caught him and charged him with stealing venison. Revenge is sweet, let the Lord pay for it, James had said angrily and proclaimed to anyone that would listen that he would as soon shoot Millin's head off as he would the head of a butterfly. He was evidently confident that he could sneak up on the ever sharp-eyed gamekeeper by coming up on him behind a hedge. It's a curious thing to shoot a man through a hedge, remarked to Mr. Prattley, who had been subjected to his rambling. It's a curious thing, James had replied, but if a man cannot rest till he has done it, what is he to do? And if he's ever taken to, he is sure to be hanged for it. Pitaway, too, had also declared that he wouldn't mind killing Millin if there were no witnesses around, and went as far as to say that there would be murder done in the forest that summer. At six o'clock on the 15th of June, 1824, Pitterway's young niece saw her uncle's gun was stored in its usual place. She would later tell a jury, however, that when she went to bed at 7.30, she noticed the gun was missing. At eight o'clock that evening, Millin passed by James's house on his daily rounds. Pitaway was following him and was then joined by James, and together they stalked the keeper into the depths of Witchwood Forest, specifically the Hensgrove Coppice. At quarter to nine, Millin's brother Joseph, himself a junior gamekeeper, heard a gunshot from the direction of the coppice. He rushed to investigate, and partway there encountered James and Pitaway walking in the other direction. James acted innocently. Was that you who fired? he asked Joseph. Joseph said he hadn't, but that he'd heard the shot. But did you hear someone cry murder? James continued. We were standing by the milking stall and heard a shot fired in Hensgrove, and a cry of murder. We thought it was the cry of your brother, Jem. Joseph decided to leave the pair, but, suspicious as ever, once out of sight, turned back and watched them stroll over to where they knew Millin lay, just beyond a gap in the wall. Joseph quickly caught them up to see his brother lying on the ground. James and Pitaway offered Joseph help to carry the corpse home, but no doubt to their horror. What lay there was no corpse. Millin was not dead, at least not yet. His thigh was broken and he was losing blood fast, but he had the strength to tell his brother exactly what had happened. The sudden appearance of James and Pitaway, and how he had been shot. Within half an hour of being carried home, he died as a result of his injuries. In this time, however, he'd given enough evidence to ensure the prosecution of James and Pitaway. Pitaway's niece proved to be the final nail in their coffin. She confirmed the absence of her uncle's gun in its normal storage place, and it took the jury little time to make a decision. They retired for just 15 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty on both men. James and Pitaway were hanged, despite protesting their innocence. 
It turns out that announcing your intentions in advance is a bit of a schoolboy error when it comes to murder. We travel only a small distance now, into the small village of Fulbrook, overlooking the famous Cotswold town of Burford across the Windrush Valley. This picturesque village is the birthplace of the infamous Dunstan brothers, Tom, Dick and Harry. The brothers were brought up at the old manor house in the village during the 18th century, and it seems they fell prey to a problem experienced by many middling families of that era. The wool trade was a thing of the past, agriculture was not proving as lucrative, and it was becoming difficult to learn the skills to thrive in a new industry. Fortunately for the three brothers, they were very good shots and entirely lacking in conscience. They embarked on a career as highwaymen, soon becoming infamous in the area. As we learned in our previous tale, Witchwood Forest was a happy hunting ground for men looking to earn a quick shilling, and this ensured a plentiful supply of victims for the Dunstan brothers. To start with, they would pick off farmers, steal their stock or route to market. But despite this small start, their reputation began to grow. They seemed to enjoy their exciting life of crime. They were as happy being shot at as they were doing the shooting. One of their signature moves was apparently to shoe their horses the wrong way round in order to evade their pursuers. Their regular haunt was known by many locals to be the George Inn in Burford, but no one was prepared to point them out and risk the consequences. Eventually, after becoming well-practiced at their game, they embarked upon a more dramatic exploit. An attack on the Oxford Mail coach profited them £500 and earned them a legendary status. The heat was well and truly turned up on the trio, so much so that they fled to Epping Forest just until things cooled down and they were able to return. It seems their overconfidence from so many successes would be their undoing. They decided to take robbery a step further and mounted a raid on Tangley Manor, a large house in between their home in Fulbrook and Stowe on the Wold. It remains in some doubt whether the owners of the manor had received a tip-off about the brothers, or were taken completely by surprise, but either way, when Dick put his arm through the unsecured shutter in the door to lift the latch on the other side, his arm was grabbed and he was unable to move. Desperate to escape, he urged his brothers to cut it off, which, with some reluctance, they did. After his arm had been gruesomely hacked off at the elbow, they managed to escape as far as Fifield. The landlord of the Merrymouth Inn was renowned for having some surgical skill, so they sought his help. He refused, so the brothers attacked him and left him for dead. But this was of no help to Dick, the one-armed bandit, who no doubt having lost a lot of blood and in some significant shock, died that night. This left Tom and Harry with limited options, so they decided they would have to bury him quietly. The next morning, a local farm worker was startled to see two mounted men leading a horse into the countryside, over which was strung the corpse of a third. Curiosity got the better of him, and he followed them silently into Witchwood Forest, where he watched them throw the corpse into a shallow grave. No doubt startled by the events he was witnessing, the worker drew attention to his presence. Tom and Harry wasted no time in shooting the man dead and throwing him 
in the hastily dug grave with their older brother before filling it in. After such an ordeal, one may expect the remaining Dunstans to lie low, but in fact, they were to get even more brazen. At Cap's Lodge Summer House on Whit Sunday, 1784, they joined in their favorite pastime, gambling. Clad in their stolen, expensive clothing, everyone was prepared to look the other way from these infamous murderers, knowing the consequences of crossing the men. The night wore on, and at four in the morning, the Dunstans were still going strong, behaving in a completely nonchalant manner about their substantial losses. Suspicions were aroused. Why were they staying so late? Do they have accomplices nearby to steal back their losses at the close of the play? It was all too much for William Harding, the tapster at Caps Lodge. He elected to try and remove Harry forcibly, grabbing him in an attempt to drag him from the room. Harry was not in the least bit phased. He pulled out one of his pistols and shot Harding at point-blank range. It seems, however, that drink had got the better of Harry, for after a brief moment when the smoke of the shot had cleared, it became clear that he'd missed. The shot had smashed up Harding's arm, but he bravely persevered, whereupon Harry pulled a second pistol, and this time shot him squarely in the chest. Inspired by the landlord's bravery, the others in the room sprung into action. Perkins and Osler at Cap's Lodge kicked Harry's feet out from under him before he was able to draw a third pistol. Tom was slow to react, and by the time he'd got his own pistols out, Perkins had grabbed one of Harry's discharged pistols and clobbered him over the head with it. At last, the Dunsons had been captured, caught red-handed, with witnesses to prove that they had shot another man. Harding was a tough individual, but some months later, he died of his injuries. Tom and Harry were found guilty of his murder and were sentenced to be hanged and gibbeted near their home in Fulbrook. It was a hot day when the bodies of the brothers were bundled into a cart and the driver, under instructions to deliver them to the tree just outside Fulbrook, decided to stop to refresh himself in Burford. He opted to have a quick pint at the George Inn. The Dunstans had stopped off for one last pint at their favourite local. Their corpses were strung in chains from an oak tree in the Witchwood Forest, with their initials carved into the bark, a grisly reminder of their nefarious lives and a warning to others contemplating something similar. For our next story, we're travelling south, all the way to the town of Techbury, or just outside. On the 26th of November, 1830, the first sign of the civil unrest that had been sweeping the country came to Gloucestershire, when a threshing machine was destroyed by local farm workers as part of a reaction against the burgeoning Industrial Revolution. Agricultural depression was on the rise in Britain. Prices were high, jobs were scarce, and agricultural workers were gradually seeing themselves being replaced by new machinery. To further exacerbate the challenges faced by these rural communities, residents received pitiful amounts of benefit from the parish, and parish residents were forced to pay the church tithe, which was often more than many could reasonably afford. All of this boiled over into a revolt, which started in Kent and swept across the country, leaving burnt haystacks and smashed up machinery in its wake. The protests were nicknamed the Swing Riots after an aggressive letter was sent to all the farm workers telling them to stop the violence, signed by a Captain Swing. 
Although the rioting took place over a short period of time in November 1830, several machines were destroyed in Tetbury, and in December, a fire broke out at a house near Winchcombe. Some 60 men were held in Gloucester jail as a result of the crimes committed in the region. Charged with breaking machines all over the Cotswolds, but mostly in North Leach, Letchlade and Tetbury. Extra policemen were recruited with militiamen and older pensioners persuaded to become volunteer special constables. Many saw these measures as well over the top, looking instead for the quarter sessions of January 1831 to quell the disturbances using the judicial system. Despite a full bench of magistrates that included the Duke of Beaufort, Marquis of Worcester and Earl Bathurst, it seems these sessions were unable to stop the protests. Many men were prepared to face the death penalty rather than give up the fight. In an interesting parallel to modern days, it was made clear at the quarter sessions that it wasn't just those who had physically destroyed machinery who should be punished. Anyone who had been found to incite or encourage the violence was to be found equally guilty. The main case under discussion in Tetbury was the destruction of a threshing machine that belonged to Jacob Hayward of Beverston near Tetbury. The machine was worth around 50 pounds and a group of 23 men and women were charged with the offence. Just before noon on the 26th of November, a crowd of over a hundred people stood on the Beverston Road, armed with pickaxes, stone hammers and sticks. The magistrates attempted to reason with them, telling them to go home peacefully, but the crowd were angry and demanded increased security and higher wages. Perhaps unsurprisingly, under such physical threat, promises were made that would never have been met. But the crowd had made up his mind anyway. They made their way to Farmer Hayward's farm and reduced his threshing machine to rubble. Jacob Hayward swore that the crowd had numbered around 200 people, probably exaggerating a bit in the heat of the moment. Whatever the size of the crowd, they went on to destroy more machinery around the farm, and by the early evening, clearly satisfied by their day of destruction, a contingent of them turned up at the Trouble House pub. As they settled in to enjoy beer and cheese, they were interrupted by soldiers who had arrived to back up the outnumbered parish constables. The troublemakers were swiftly apprehended, along with other protesters who had earlier destroyed another threshing machine in Fairford. They were dealt varying punishments. A lucky handful were discharged. Many received prison sentences of six months to three years, and the more unfortunate ones were transported to Australia for up to 14 years. It seems ironic that these protesters actually put more people out of work by their wrecking of machinery. It had achieved little to help them out of poverty. Another example, perhaps, of the futility of fighting progress. Either way, it highlighted just how dangerously big a gap there was between rich and poor in the 19th century Cotswolds. We finish our dark tour of the Cotswolds on a slightly lighter note, back in the north of the region. Our story here is that of Reverend Robert William Hippisley, known to be a troublesome local rector for almost 50 years. He was from a privileged background, educated at Eton before attending Exeter College in Oxford for his degree. Robert was ordained in 1840 and became rector of Stowe in 1844. The church had become highly neglected during the tenure as rector of Robert's grandfather, 
John Hibbisley. Robert's first act, therefore, was to restore the church, mostly using his own money, which could be seen as a considerable act of charity. But in retrospect, many think it was designed to immortalize him as a generous philanthropist who saved his local church. Either way, it seems he was not a modest man, very keen to make an impression and concerned of how he would be remembered after he died. It seems he was determined to have a hand in the running of any community enterprise, much to the consternation of other key players in the town. On numerous occasions, he had run-ins over the organisation of the school. Frustrated with his interference, the school board decided to begin their lessons at 9am, the same time that schoolchildren were supposed to be attending a church service. Hearing of this, he decided to fight fire with fire and moved the church service to 11.30am, suggesting that schoolchildren should be lifted out of school to attend. Unsurprisingly, he found himself with an empty church when the clock chimed 11.30. His next move was to try legally to change the opening hours of the school, putting him in direct conflict with the school board. On one occasion they refused to admit him entry to the school, after which he called for the police. He was, however, ignored. Giving up this attempt, he was forced to leave the premises, but by this time a crowd of onlookers had gathered and they laughed derisively at him. The following day, he actually made it into the school and disrupted one of the lessons. This struggle for power was to go on for some time. It seems the locals only had some kind of reprieve when he decided to go on holiday. When planning the Queen's Golden Jubilee celebrations in 1887, Hippisley remarked, There should be no unseemly merrymaking on that day, which riled his parishioners. It got to the point where poems were composed, mocking his actions. But perhaps the best example of what the locals thought of him was to come on bonfire night. On the 5th of November 1898, the traditional bonfire was lit on the town green in Stone the Wold, near the Bell Inn. It lasted a short time, so it wasn't long before the locals dispersed. At 10 p.m., many were startled awake by the frantic ringing of a handbell echoing through the streets. Naturally, a crowd congregated to see what all the fuss was about a procession of people carrying an effigy, dressed in black, clearly resembling a minister's dark clothing, was parading through the town. Unmistakably, the effigy was that of Rector Robert Hippisley. It was carried along Church Street and round the Market Square and then into what was known locally as Hilly Park, coming to a halt at the back of the rectory. Such a commotion would undoubtedly have roused all the residents of the rectory who will have come out just in time to see the effigy burned with great ceremony. It was a peaceful, almost formal affair. People were spellbound by the sight of an effigy of one of the town's most prominent people being burned within the sight of his own home. It's probably no coincidence, however, that less than a week later, Robert resigned from his position as rector, retiring to Lower Swell, where he lived out his days cared for by his unmarried daughter Gertrude. He died aged 83, surrounded by his family. The local press printed an obituary which stated, His long incumbency was marked by much unrest in the parish, his eccentricity leading him into frequent conflict with his colleagues and the local authorities. So it was 
that he will be remembered not for rescuing the church from dereliction, but for the friction he had with his local community. Relatively speaking, certainly compared to some of the other characters we've heard of in tonight's story, Robert Hippies Lee was tiresome, but fairly harmless. I do hope you've enjoyed our horrific tales this Halloween. It's been enormous fun travelling the area, discovering the dark tales of our favourite region. <laughs>